great accuracy, it, uh, the chronological order of, of happenings, spiritual happenings uh, during this time of dedication of the temple, sp specifically what we're going to be talking about, uh, the preparation, the construction of, the dedication of, its achievements, its splendor. Uh, then the rest of uh, Chronicles goes into uh, all the different rulers of uh, Judah, and, and then it ends with the exile. But we're going to stick around uh, the, the temple, its creation and its dedication. Second Chronicles will be the text this morning. It's, uh, again, it, it, it's an historical account of the victories as well as the failings of God's people. It details their good decisions, and it details their bad decisions. I used to have a sign uh, hanging up at, in my office, and it used to say this, Good judgment comes from experience, and experience comes from bad judgment. I don't know who wrote that, but that was a pretty good quote, and I used to keep it. I just would write the word unknown underneath it, but I would, I would uh, look to that often. I would like to just read a portion to you. And again, I'm going to be jumping back and forth. And if you're going to try to follow me, I don't know how successful that would be. Because uh, I'm just going to read some and stop talking about it and go back to it. But if you're in 2 Chronicles chapter 5, if you look at verse 11, I'm going to start there and I'm going to read a couple of verses to you. And it says this. And when the priests came forth for, uh, from the holy place, for the priests who were present had sanctified themselves without regard to divisions, and all the Levitical singers, Asaph, Haman, uh, Jenathun, and their sons and kin, uh, kins hearts, uh, or kinsmen, clothed in fine linen, some of your Bibles may say Ephes, uh, E-P-H-O-D-S, that's uh, the fine linen dress that they would wear, with cymbals and harps and lyres, standing east of the altar, because you know, and um, in, in why this is, I don't know. Uh, but the, the 12 tribes of Israel, they were splits. Three tribes would be at, stand at the north of the temple, three at the east, three at the west, three at the south. Uh, but the, uh, the, they were now standing at the east of the altar. And with them, 120 priests blowing trumpets. That's what they were doing. In unison, they were doing it all together. And apparently they had practice. Boy, practice, you need practice. You need to practice a lot of things. You need to practice praying. You need to practice reading the Bible. You need to practice being kind. You need to practice patience. That is the worst thing anybody can pray for me is patience. Because I'm not a patient person. My family, their heads are about to fall off their shoulders, nodding their head. I, I'm not a patient person. And uh, if it, and I'm boring too. I'm a pretty boring person. I'm pretty domesticated. My wife will tell you this. I've got three, I've got a bunch of suits. I've got a dozen, maybe a dozen. Um, three colors though. Gray, blue, and black. Gray, blue, and black. That's what I wear. Gray, blue, or black. My ties, this is a, this is as fancy as it gets. It doesn't get much fancier than this. I'm, I'm, and, and I've got a routine. If you ever go to the fish camp on Tuesdays at noon, I will be there at the fish camp with, with my brother, uh, Matt Morrow, who is the Ameripro Tim. Um, we like pot roast, and that's where they serve them on Tuesdays. That's where we are. If we go to El Chapala, there's only one thing I'll eat there. It's um, chicken chimichanga. I like that. El Ranchero, the, the big burrito. El Bronco burrito. The Bronco burrito. Yeah. Uh, I'm pretty, uh, pretty uh, I watch only the same programs, Restaurant Impossible. That's pretty good. Survivor. Survivor reminds me of city council. That's the reason I like it. <laughs> Much of that there. Um, so, um, and I wear the same haircut. Um, I usually don't have it this gray. I tended it gray to look more distinguished for you. Uh, so, uh, so anyway, uh, practicing, practicing patience, and practicing uh, loving one another. Practicing, practicing loving those that are not very lovable. You ever run into those people? They're just not lovable. Whatever you do, uh, I mean, they'll argue with you whether water is wet or not. They will argue with you. They, they don't practice. Uh, but we have to practice it because we know the end of the story. We know the God that we sing to. We know the God uh, that, that sits on the throne. Amen. And because of that, we have that greater responsibility. And where they at here, while they're in unison with the trumpeteers and the singers who are able to uh, were to make themselves heard with one voice. And you know, I'll stop right there to one voice. 
Not separate voices, not many divisions, not many different commentaries, but one voice because they had one understanding. They knew that there was one true and living God. There's only one God that you pray to in heaven that brings about the miracles that we have here on earth. And that's one of the biggest criticisms that I have. I make it no doubt, no doubt, there's no doubt that there's only one true and living God, and that is Jesus the Christ. There is by, under no name our prayers answered. There are under no name our blessings bestowed. There is but the one true living God, and that is Jesus Christ. Amen. I know for politicians it's real popular to say, well, we're just going to love that person because they're, you know, they're, they're, um, they have feelings toward Islam, or they have feelings toward uh, Hinduism, or they, uh, you know, they embrace it. Well, listen, I embrace the person. I love the person. God tells me to, but there's only one true and living God, and that is Jesus Christ. So Amen. I will tell you that and will not apologize for that. And um, that's my conviction. So where was I at? I stopped. One voice to praise and glorify the Lord. When they lifted up their voice accompanied by trump, uh, trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music. And when they praised the Lord saying, He indeed is good for His loving kindness. For His loving kindness is everlasting. Then the house, the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud. Wow. I would have. Let's talk about that for a minute. The temple is planned. It was built to holy specifications. Uh, we're already at that point in history. Uh, worship ut uh, utensils and sacrificial livestock was inventoried and, and placed. The Ark of the Covenant is set to illustrate God's presence and power as well uh, as, well as his, his great love for His people. Uh, the praise choir, the praise choir they apparently had practiced and, and musicians had gathered. All the priests and the ministers of music, including Asaph, who was one of the contributors to uh, the, the book of Psalms, I believe he wrote 12 of them, and he was appointed by King David to lead public worship. I, I love quoting David at city council meetings. I, whenever, whenever a pastor is not available to pray at city council meetings, I normally revert back to a prayer prayed in, um, in, in the Old Testament. And I love to, to quote David. One of the most successful politicians ever was David, King David. And what did he do? He said that they were going to have public worship. Boy, we've come a long way since then, haven't we? But anyway, there King David was. Uh, he had appointed those to lead public worship, and they were there. They were there to, uh, to pray, and they were there to praise and sing of God's great glory. They showed up in their finest dress. You saw it in the white linens. They began to praise, and uh oh, they may have even raised their hands while they were singing and praise. They may have done it. I think they did. The music and the voices of adoration unto God garnered heavenly attention just as it did, just like it happened back in Exodus, Exodus chapter 40, if you read that, when a cloud appeared amongst the people and it filled the church. And you know what they called that, the what kind of glory? The Shekinah glory, the presence of God. It was so powerful, so powerful that they could do little more than just kneel. That's what they were doing. Neil, back if you go back and read Exodus 40, what happened to Moses? Couldn't even get up. The power couldn't even go in the tabernacle. The presence of God filled it up. And that's God, God's presence is a blessing. I, I wish I could have been there at that. We read in, in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 6, and I, I won't be coming back and forth, but I like what it says in chapter 6 where Solomon dedicates the temple, and the first thing he does. The first thing he does, the very first verse of chapter 6, he recognizes who the church belongs to, doesn't he? He recognizes who the church re uh, really belongs to. It doesn't belong to the pastor. I think Rick and Judy will tell you that. They will tell you that joy outreach is not theirs. They don't own it. It doesn't belong to them. It also doesn't belong to the head deacon. This church doesn't have deacons, does it? See, I, does it? Oh, yeah. It doesn't belong to them. You know, um, doesn't belong to the head usher or doesn't belong to the minister of music that I think you're talented so that I just had it in a political way just to make peace between us doesn't belong to the minister of music and thank goodness it doesn't belong to the mayor I can tell you that because I'd mess it up it wasn't controlled by a family or a founding family of the church Solomon recognizes immediately that, that God alone was the head of the church and that church was his 
dwelling place. The place that you would come and hit, you know what? I know church begins at 1030, but I can promise you, I know the first one was here this morning. Was it you, Kay? Were you the first one here this morning? Who was the first one here this morning? Who? Who were you? Brian. I don't Who? Probably Brian. Brian? Well, Brian, God was here before you got here this morning. And He was awaiting you. And He was awaiting you. And He was wanting you to be here. And He's glad that you are here. Because He needs you here. And He pulls you in. Because this is His dwelling place. And He loves for you to be a part of it. And to be here. Going down, I like to stop at verse 3. And it just says that Solomon blesses the people. And you know what? That's what godly leaders do. They bless people. They bless the people. What a great leadership example. What a great leadership example that we're reading here. Just that one verse. I'm not I forgot. I'd like to read it. Then the, key, then the king faced about and blessed all the assembly of Israel. While all the assembly of Israel was standing. He blesses them. What happened next has had implications ever since. What I'm about to read you has changed world history forever. And it's only four words. What I'm about to read to you has made a world of difference. And it will make, continue to make a world of difference. And that's found in verse 6. And it's just about the first four words. And what does it say? I have chosen Jerusalem. God has chosen a dwelling place here on earth. Now, it's not me just saying that. But what David wrote him here two, uh, two weekends ago that said that. It wasn't Sherlock Valley. Boy, I love Sherlock Valley. <laughs> I love that guy. Was he not great? I enjoyed being with him. I enjoyed David. Now, David doesn't have the charisma, did he, that Sherlock had. But I really enjoyed him. I had, uh, they were in my home. And, um, they were not able to publicize this, but uh, Sherlock Valley and David Rogan was were in my home that Tuesday night with every member of the Brevard City Council and with the county commissioners. They were in our, our home, and um, Sherlock spoke to us. So did David Rogan. I joined them both. Um, David uh, Rogan, um, he, he, he didn't say a lot. When he said he said with a lot of, he was pretty stern with me. I mean, he, but I enjoyed him. I really did. And uh, But those four words, I have chosen Jerusalem. Boy, wars and conflict, has, does that not make up Jerusalem's DNA? It just does. It always has. It's the Temple Mount, the most contentious 34 acres on the entire earth. And it's right there at the Temple Mount. It's a place where the fatherhood of God has not brought about the brotherhood of man, has it? It's, uh, but it is the city of our God, the mountain of his holiness, and you read that in Psalms 48. But the Bible is clear. Jerusalem is where God has chosen to dwell on earth. I'd like to read to you <coughs> chapter 6, verses 7 through 9. It says this. Now it was in the heart of my father David to build a house for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. But the Lord said to my father, David, because it was in your heart to build a house for my name, you did well that it was in your heart. Nevertheless, you shall not build the house, but your son, whom you shall be, shall be born to you, he shall build the house in my name, and he will be there forever. Um, David was a man of war. And God didn't allow him to build the temple. Was passed down to Solomon. The passage establishes a spiritual legacy, however, that I think is very important, and I want you to hear this. This passage establishes a spiritual legacy, a ministry that still goes on in the church today. We don't really have to go much deep into the Bible to, to understand that Abraham prayed over his son Isaac. Isaac bore Jacob, and the blessings went out from there. Jesus spoke of it. In Galatians chapter 3, that the blessings, the blessings on all of the Gentiles, it'll come down to, as a matter of fact, let me just read that. I love, I love this because this is part of the reason I pray over my children every night. I pray the same prayer. It's found in the book of uh, Galatians. And it says this, uh, Galatians 3.14, In order that in Christ, 
Christ Jesus the blessings of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Amen. I pray over my children every night. I lay my hands. Matter of fact, they will not go to church. I mean, go to bed at night. They will not go to bed until they're blessed. Hopefully your children are experiencing the same thing. You have the opportunity and the power to make a difference in your children's life just because they know, if they know, that you want to bless them and pray over them. You can do that. I pray over my children. You heard me say this a couple of weeks ago. I, matter of fact, the little child, uh, Trinity. The little child, Trinity, can I put my hands I pray the very same prayer over her that I pray over my children. Lord, I pray the blessing of Abraham upon this child. I pray that the Holy Spirit brings them health, happiness, wisdom, and protection in the name of Jesus. If they have that, they don't need anything else. You give them health, happiness, wisdom, and protection. What else do they need? They need they have that through Jesus Christ. And they would have that because of their faith in Him. Or then they would have what they need. Uh, David inspired his son Solomon to serve God. Billy Graham's spiritual legacy continues on not only in his daughter, but also in his son Franklin, who by the way has gone on to touch uh, people abroad through his uh, uh, Samaritan's Purse ministry. And by the way, does it is it not silly that the media sometimes makes that controversial? Is that not the most silly thing that the media does? Uh, they're going to be controversial that when they pass out food, they pass out Scripture. Boy, I tell you what. Uh, have we not lowered ourselves to criticize such things? And then, of course, you see Joel Osteen on TV. I don't watch a lot of Joel Osteen. I, I just know. I, I think he's a fine man. I'm glad he's there. My father met him on a cruise on his way to Alaska, met him there, and he said, he said he's in fun. But, but it, he didn't start that Lakewood church there in Houston, Texas. It was his father John. Spiritual legacy happens. It happens because you pray over your children. It happens because they see you practicing what? Loving the unlovable. It happens because they see you doing what? Reading what? The Bible. And hopefully you have given your children Bibles. And Bibles that they can understand and read and they know and they see you at church and they see you holding up your hands. They see you at a time of real pressure and real need praying. They see you at a time whenever... Well, in my case, after a long day, just recognizing and realizing that, you know what, I just can't do it. Not me, I mean, I can't do it on my own. And all of you have your own pressures. You have your own, your own spots that, that keep you from from um, being the, the, the person that others think you ought to be. I can tell you this. Again, family, do not knock your heads off your shoulders agreeing with me on this so much. Um, you cannot sow wild oats from Monday through Sunday or through Saturday and come to church on so Sunday and pray for crop failure. Now, I know me. I know me better than you know me. I think I know me better than my wife knows me, even though she finishes my sentences most of the time. Um, it is difficult to be that day-to-day -day person that you want to be, that Paul so struggled to be, and you find yourself at, at a place of fault and failure at the end of the day. You say, why did I respond that way? Why did I act that way? Why did I get mad and keep that thing or drop that? thing or say that thing. What is wrong with me? And But you do what David did. What did God say about David? He was a man after his own heart. Because David did with sin what you do with sin. You take it to the altar. You take it to the prayer room. And uh, that's so uh, your children and your grandchildren need to see that. They need to see what you do and how you respond in a time of real pressure. Spiritual examples of, of spiritual legacy. Matter of fact, it's biblical. Let me just throw some scripture out to you, and I want you to write these down if you have a pen and paper. Write down Psalms 102.18. What does that say? It says, write this down for the next generation so people not yet born 
will praise God. In other words, God is saying, write these things down because there's going to be people coming after you. I want them to know. I want them to be successful. I want them to be blessed. I want them to know me. And he gives a scripture to back it up. Joel 1.3 says this, Tell it to your children. Tell it to your children and let your children tell it to their children and their children to the next generation. In other words, God has an expectation that you're going to take Christian responsibility and that you're going to write things down. You're going to learn Scripture. You're going to know the principles and precepts of God found in the Scripture. And you're going to teach it to your children so they can teach it to their children and the next generation on and beyond. Isaiah 38, 19 says, One generation makes known your faithfulness to the next. That is a responsibility. It is a responsibility. And if you begin to start fostering a spiritual legacy through your children or grandchildren, it gives you the opportunity to touch the future. But they got to see it. they got to see you here. They need to see you in this church. They need to see you on your knees at the altar. Matter of fact, for most of you, and I hope this is true, the best view in the house is when you're on your knees. you got to understand that. I like what J.P. Morgan said. J.P. Morgan, he, he is a, a multi-millionaire. This guy had a lot of money. And um, his will was, was, became a public document somehow. I didn't think that was possible, but it did. Um, if my will ever gets revealed, you'll find out I'm not a multi-millionaire. <laughs> yes. But, uh, <laughs> Oh, I've got riches in heaven anyway. Uh, but his, his, his will had over 10,000 words in it. Over 10,000 words was found in his will. But I'm going to read you just one paragraph. I think this is probably the most important part of his will. And it says this. I, and, and he wrote this to his children. He had all the money to leave them, all the property, all the stocks, the bonds, the gold bullion. He, he, he had plenty to leave them, but this is what's important to him. And this is what he wrote. This is the words of J.P. Morgan's will. It says, I commit my soul into the hands of my Savior, full of confidence that having redeemed me and washed me with his most precious blood, he will present me faultless, faultless before the throne of my Heavenly Father. This is so important here. I entrust my children to maintain and defend at all hazard and at all costs of personal sacrifice the blessed doctrine of complete atonement of sin through the blood of Jesus Christ once offered and through that alone. That was the important instruction in that 10,000 word will that he left, this multi-millionaire, that was the most important instruction that he could leave. Because that was his legacy. That his children would grow to know the one true and living God. The one who could, only, the only one that has ever made sacrifice that could redeem us because he loved us that much. Because he's prepared a place for you and I in heaven. Verse 11 says this, God reaffirms that every time you come to church, He's going to be there to minister to you and your needs. And how did he do that? He set the ark there. The ark of the covenant. His presence. His symbol of presence. He set it there and he wanted to make sure. And you know, you read verse 13. I like to get into things. I read verse 13. And uh, matter of fact, I'm going to read it to you now. And it says, Now Solomon had made a bronze platform. Five cubits long, five cubits wide, and three cubits high. And had sat in the midst of the court... And he stood on it, knelt on his knees in the presence of all of the assembly of Israel. By the way, another good leadership example. Another good leadership example. And spread out his hands toward heaven. I don't know if he was Baptist or not. I don't think he was if he was doing that. And I go to a lot of Baptist churches and I like to raise my hands. You got to see some of the looks they get. But that's okay. They're going to cut. They're going to find out. Uh, bronze. Being in the hardware business, I know a little bit about bronze. Bronze is 90% copper and 10% tin. That's its makeup. That's, that, that's the chemical compound that makes up bronze. And I want you to know that any percentage of copper is expensive. It's just an expensive element. But then it gets into cubics, and I'm like, you know, this really is not ministering to me. I don't understand how long it or how, how much of a cubic is. And So I did some research, and so just so you'll know, because I don't want you to be ignorant. 
because I was ignorant and I had people over to ask me, I wouldn't have been able to tell, but now I know because I looked it up and Googled it. The pulpit stage was seven and a half foot by seven and a half foot, and it was four foot tall. And it must have been nice. And presumably it was solid bronze. And that would that would have been expensive. And I want you to know this. I don't mind fancy churches. I like them. I like fancy churches. Uh, I like churches that have nice fixtures. I like overhead projectors. I like heated baptismals. I like leather-bound hymnals with uh, gold leaf pages. I like uh, these mega churches that, that have uh, on-campus bookstores and on-campus transportation, usually golf carts, and they take Saturday excursions to these um, uh, Texas-style uh, flea markets. And that's fine. I don't mind all of that as long as the rest of verse 13 happens. And what does it say? Praise. You take praise out of the church. You take ministry out of the church. All you've got is a social club. And I don't know about you, but I've got a busy life to lead. To lead. I don't have time for social clubs. I don't have any more meetings that I have time to go to. I've told people this time after time. If you're going to come to church and it's just a nice little event where you've got to come and take up an offering and sing some songs, everybody leave happy but leave empty, then I don't have time for that because that's, that, that's playing. Amen. And I don't have time to play. And I know you don't either. That's the reason when I come to this church, I get so filled and so rejoiced and so um, motivated because I know at this church where the assembly comes together, there is praise and there is worship. And I am glad that uh, Joy Outreach is here. I want to go back to spiritual legacy for just a second. Are you raised in church, Mary? You, 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 but you've been in church for how long now? Eight years. Eight years. Without that eight years in going to church, would you have just, without eight years, would you have just gone to New York City and started ministering? No. It took you being in the assembly. It took you being a part. It took you uh, a part of you coming to church <clears throat> sitting next to people that can look at you and say, you know, I know something's wrong. Let me pray with you. I know it took, a, it took you sitting in church and singing songs of adoration and strengthening and filling the Holy Spirit and being a part of a church body. And that's the reason the Bible says, do not forsake yourselves in the assembly. Amen. That's also the reason it says, behold how beautiful and pleasant it is for brethren to gather together. Amen. You've got to have a place where you come. And church attendance is part of it. So anyway, um, but when you get there, the expectation is that there's praise. And I'm glad that, 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 that this church has it because you're mimicking. You're doing exactly what, what Solomon did. And Solomon was a, uh, was a wise man. Perhaps, the, uh, however, the wisest thing that he ever said, and you see, read it in verse 18, he says, Heaven cannot contain thee. Heaven cannot contain thee. Solomon recognized God's glory. You know what he did? He recognized His glory and he got out of the way. He let the Holy Spirit minister. That happens a lot here, I recognize. Sometimes the event will begin to play, the music will start, the words will be there, but then I'll listen and I'm not hearing what the words are saying or are reading. I'm hearing praise just go on. And people over here praising. People on this side praising. Praising you you're, you're in your own way. And I think that's a great thing. You continue to do that because I know that's the Holy Spirit speaking to you. Raise your hands. Dance. Wave, wave the banners. Be, uh, you know, you're in God's sanctuary. And what is sanctuary? That's a hiding place. It's a place where you run to. That is sanctuary. I need sanctuary in my life. So anyway, the rest of this chapter, the rest of this chapter is really a prayer of dedication. It gives us clear instruction on, on the direction of prayer. Verse 20 talks about prayer. No better place, no better place than church to pray. No better opportunity as a group than, than at a church to pray. Praying churches last. Dying churches haven't prayed in a long time. Um, you know, men, uh, missionaries, missionaries report that early African converts quickly grasped the power of prayer. They saw a place in the bush. They would find a place in the bush where they could go and they would take out a hatchet or machete and they would clear a path in the thicket 
And they would find a place where they could be alone with God. That's where they would kneel and that's where they would pray. And they would find time with God. They would also be so devoted to prayer that they would go there often. Often wearing out a dirt path to their patch of, of ground that they would go and or prepared for, for prayer. And if they observed a brother or sister in Christ failing in their Christian walk, they would say, brother, don't let grass grow in your path. That's where that saying came from. Wouldn't it be nice, wouldn't it be nice if we had to take up a special offering every year to replace the carpet because the carpet would be worn out right here where this altar is at? Wouldn't it be nice if we had to have car washes or a fun drive because the carpet here just wore out? We throw, we'll throw Throw, we'll put throat ropes over it to make it last, but we'll wear that out too. Wouldn't that be a good thing? Look at these nice altars. I know who built them. You know who built them, don't you? Richard Hinkle? Richard, you know that? He's not, where's Smiley at? Now, I call him Smiley. You don't know him by Smiley. He's not here, is he? I'm going to get on to him. I know he goes to church here. What you don't know about Richard? You know when I first met him? 1983. In the service, I was in the Air Force station at uh, Warner Robins Air Base, and I had come home for a week. And when I went back, he was already there. <laughs> Tell you this quick story: you can poke him about this. I, I was the uh, I was already a sergeant, but I had only a little over a year left, and they asked me to just stay in the dorm situation. And uh, I had only I only had four stripes. You you were an admiral. I was way down from where you were, Admiral Jackson, but. Uh, I had uh, these stripes, but I was an NCO, non-commissioned officer, and they'd asked me to be in the dorms, kind of be the non-commissioned officer on site, overlooking the dorm, and I had the nicest room, I got to have it by myself, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and anyway, um, I, came, uh, I came back on a, on a Monday morning, and I was there, and we were getting ready, we were getting our uniforms on, we were in the, in the, uh, in the shaving, shaving room and all that, and he came in, and he, wrecked, he had been there a week. Well, he hadn't seen me, saw me as a new face. He says, oh, you must be new here. He said, let me tell you something. I've been here a while, and I know this place pretty pretty, pretty well. And uh, things are, you know, you follow me, and things will be kind of smooth, and, and you just hang around me, and I'm, at, and I'm listening to this guy. And I've been there already a year. I was just on leave for a week. And uh, he said, you know, you hang around me. I'll teach you the ropes. And he says, yeah, there's a guy here. Uh, Harris, Sergeant Harris, but I haven't met him yet, apparently. <laughs> I'm sitting there, I'm listening to him. <laughs> well, we had to leave there. We had to go uh, to our squadron and fall out. And to his surprise, I was the one that uh, called everybody to attention. And I, <laughs> I remember walking up to him and I said, No, I'm Sergeant Harris. <laughs> you and I don't get to know each other. That was in 1980, and I fell in love with him. <laughs> and he's a great guy. And as you can see, he's a master craftsman. But getting back, wouldn't that be a great place to wear out the carpet? Uh, quickly, going down to verse 22, it says, If a man sits against his neighbor and is made to take an oath, and he comes and takes an oath before thine altar in this house, well, that's talking about relationships, isn't it? Church relationships. Talking to the person, you may not sit by them at every church service, but you know them. And if you see them in the community, you want to make sure you give them a thumbs up. You want to make sure that you interact with this church relationship. Because I can tell you something, there's not, from experience, and you know this too, there's not a lot of places to run to. But you can run to your church family. You can be a part of your church family. Your church family will quickly put you on the prayer list. It's your church family. Embrace your spiritual siblings. Support and love them regardless of their faults and failures. And uh, for, for, for those of you who have, uh, who have made a, a, a habit out of <laughs> faults and failures like I have, why, well, I, I want you to know that a good word, an encouraging word can sustain you. Isaiah 50 verse 4 says that. Disaster and attack, verse 24, I can tell you that happens often. Happens to me, but it also happens to you. You ever feel beat, beat up by the world? That ever happened to you? You ever feel that, uh, you know, that life just isn't fair? That you tried to do the right thing, right thing didn't happen, and you had to pay the consequences? You ever feel that, 
that uh, things just not going your way, people just don't understand, no matter what good you try to do or try to get across, uh, you just can't find any peace there. Well, I want you to know that you're not alone. I want you to know that this church, this place of respite, is here and God has created it for you to be able to come and be a part. And I want you to take on the attitude that whenever you go to church, you're not there to give, but you're there to receive. This is a place to come and receive. Quickly, I see my time is coming up. And the reason I'm talking to you about this is because I know, I know that sometimes you come and you say to yourself, you know, I, I'm coming to church and I believe we're doing all the right things. First of all, I want you to know that you are. And you know that you are. I'm not here to grade or judge. Or, but I'm so glad that you're part of a fellowship that recognizes that whenever you come, this is a place where you meet God at His dwelling place. This is His. Uh, it's a place of confession. I'm happy about that. Um, I, in, in talking about confession, let me tell you something about church. Let me tell you about where you're sitting. I personally, this is just personally me, I never made a decision about the Lord that I made sitting out there that I should have made up here that I ever kept. Those life-changing decisions that I made about the Lord always came at a place of altar. Always came at a place of kneeling. It always came to that hiding place where you had to meet God. Verse 32, I like what it says. You gotta, you, you, you gotta welcome people. You gotta welcome people and you gotta invite them to church. If you don't, they probably will not come. Okay? It's called advertising. I know some people say, that's too much of a secular term. You've got to advertise. You've got to invite people to church. Hey, what are you doing Sunday morning at 1030? You need to come. Why don't you come with me? Why don't you ride with me? I'll take you. In verse 33, it's, a, it's the equipping for the ministry. I, I, you know, I've never heard of a great preacher or evangelist that wasn't a regular church attendee that made an impact on others. Um... How many of you would go to a doctor that skipped a year of med school? I don't really need to go. I'm going to skip that year. I know it already. Or go to a surgeon. You wouldn't do that, would you? No. So you want to be a regular attendee. Because when you come here, whether you recognize it or not, and, and, and you may not even get it today from me, but whenever you come, you learn something. You learn from your brother or your sister. Either they're sitting in front of you or sitting behind you. Maybe you learn something by singing today. Maybe you learn something by just observing somebody and recognizing, wow, what a person of faith. Wow, the next time I go through that, I know that person's prayer program. That's somebody I can rely on. And you feel confident in them. And that happens at church where the saints gather together. For most of you, and this is kind of verse 33 and 35, it covers this, it talks about victory. For most of us, victory is not going to happen on the athletic field, is it? It will never happen for me. Maybe my son. It will never happen in the boardroom for me or on, or on Wall Street or Main Street or in Washington. It will come, most of your victories will come when you are alone with God. When you come to that point where, where God's Word will set on you and, and set you on a victorious course that will bring about peace and understanding in your everyday life. Let God put victory where victory has not been. And, and, and the last thing I want to touch on, and this is all about church worship, church ministry, the equipment of the saints, and this is what they did whenever... Everything that I've gone across is things that Solomon said as they were dedicating the church temple. The last thing, verse 41. And there was eight points, and this is the last one. This is salvation. I know of no other place more accessible to the public where they can hear the salvation message than the church. Thank God for the church. Others say, well, I can watch it on TV, I can hear it on radio, or I can view it on the internet. And I'm glad for those ministries, but they do not take the place of fellowship. You need to be here at your church. A radio cannot baptize you. Um, the, the, the internet cannot meet you at the altar. And a TV preacher cannot come to the hospital whenever you're there or a loved one is, is there playing with fever or injury. Your pastor can where did you first learn about Jesus? For most of you, I would say it was at church. That's where it happened for me. That's where it happened for me. My parents... Um, um, see, I had a drug problem. My parents drug me to church. 
And uh, I'm glad they did. I'm glad that they made me go. I used to pitch a fit and whine, moan, and groan, complain. I'm not gone. They sing songs. They, they, read, by, they read the King James Version where there was the these and the thous and the wherefore it is this. And I didn't understand it and I didn't think I needed to go. And so they bought me a Bible that I could read and understand. And then I even complained, but then I felt. But because I saw that spiritual legacy, I saw what they did with troubles, and I saw what they did with despair, and they met God at the altar. And that was an example. And that's where it's going to happen for you too. That's where it's going to happen for your children and your grandchildren. And as a as a great prayer, King Solomon prayed and and they had a dynamic dedication of that church. But you know what? It didn't last. Because we find in history that 332 years later, that was a lot of time went by, 332 years later, they had a new king, they had a new culture, they had different people. They had the same God, the same temple, but we find that the temple was not even a place where they went and worshipped. You know what they were using the temple for at that time? A bank. A bank. That's where they would bring all of their gold. They would bring where they bring all of their uh, precious belongings, and they would set it because they were so religious enough to know if I were to take my belongings, just write my name on a piece of masking tape or sticking it wherever they had it done, and say this belongs to you know this belongs to Jimmy, and I could set it there. Nobody. It was the safest place you could go. Nobody would go there and take it because they were that religious. Well, I can't steal in God's house. So it was the safest place. Boy, they had it really, but that's all they would do in the temple. It was just a place where they kept their precious belongings. It wasn't a place where they were going and worshiping. And guess who found out about that? They is named. In Antiochus Epiphanes. You never remember him in history? Antiochus Epiphanes. Um, when he needed money to pay his soldiers, guess what he raided? The temple. Because that's where the gold was. That is where the money was. So he went there and he raided it. And that's where, it, it, plus they sacrificed, put it on the altar. And um, see, he ransacked the temple because it, lo it looked like a church. It had all of the, the utensils like a church. It, 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 they had the hymnals, I'm sure, like a church. They just were not acting like a church. So it was ransacked. And... Um, a big part of that is because they had no Bible there. You know that's true in history as well. You know there was a time, and you, and you can read Second Chronicles chapter thirty-four about verse fifteen. Um, they were doing renovations in the temple, and they tore down a wall. And guess what they found? The Bible, the Torah. And they said, "What's this?" It was God's word, and they had forgotten about it. Now the temple has a lot of the workers at the temple. Matter of fact, we read earlier where when they were dedicating it, there was a lot of priests and they had different divisions. The divisions that they're talking about is they had some priests that looked after the shepherd animals. Uh, some of the shepherds were priests. They would bring the animals in for sacrifice. There were some that would keep up with the utensils. Some of them would keep up with the altar and the incense on the altar. There were different divisions, different jobs. And there were some that were scribes. Now I'm wondering what those guys were doing when there was no Bible. They just, for, because it turned into a program, it didn't turn into a place of worship. So I say all of that to say to you that let this church be a place where you come to, where the Bible is preached. Let me just let you know that this is a place where praise and adoration to God can be lifted up. But let it be a place where you learn. Let it be a place where you develop a spiritual legacy. I see some young people here, and I want you to recognize the people around you because it's important. I, uh, you'll notice that two of my children do not look exactly like me. They act like me, but they don't look like me. And I'm not saying that's a good thing. Um, my wife and I have adopted all three of our children. Blessings. Wonderful blessings. One of them's down, the loud one is downstairs. This building must be soundproof. Uh, but my wife picked up the book and it says, I wish for you a beautiful life. And um, it's full of letters that the mothers 
And, and in this case, a Korean mother and our daughter Cassie, her ethnicity is is is, is uh, Korean or her heritage is Christianity. But um, I was reading this, and and I these are just letters, and and I wanted just just one paragraph, one paragraph only in this letter that it says. It says, after a lot of consideration, I found the answer. The answer that she found, she, it's, the letter begins with a lot of pain and a lot of hurt about the decision. And that's what this mother was going through. But she says this, after a lot of consideration, I found the answer. I realized that the best thing I can do is pray for your obedience to God and for your future health and happiness. That's where spiritual legacy begins. That's what should be going on in churches all across America. Whether they're Pentecostal, whether they're hard shell Baptist, fundamentalist, Lutheran, Presbyterian, doesn't matter. That's what should be going on. Prayer and praise. Lifting up the brothers and saints in Christ. I'm glad I was here this morning because I needed this message probably as bad as you did. As I was going over and reading and recognizing, I, I, I think of Solomon and I think of all the choices that he made in his life and I know the difficult things that he went through and the pressure points on his life and all of you have them. He remembered what was most important. He remembered what what the call on his life was and what his actions and reactions should be. And that was turn to, to turn to the one and true living God. I'm going to ask that you just stand down and I'm going to end this in prayer. I want to thank you for inviting me to come. You always make me feel welcome. You always make me feel loved. And I want to thank you for, for reaching out to me and my family and uh, being a blessing. So uh, I want to bless you as you go. And uh, but you be a difference maker. You be a difference maker wherever you go. In whatever walk of life you have. Look for others. Look for others in need. Especially brothers and sisters in Christ. Whether they attend this church or not. Amen. Look for them. Father God, we're grateful today for your loving kindness. Thank you for your gift. The one and only true living sacrifice. And that would be Jesus Christ by which we're saved. Thank you for this day. We pray a hedge of protection around Rick and Judy as they're not with us this morning. We pray that you bless them and bless this time that they're with their family. I thank you for each and every person that's here this morning. I pray your blessing on them. Touch their lives. And touch their lives in such a way that they want to go out and touch the future in your name. I pray, Lord, whatever is upon them, whatever task is before them, that you give them the spiritual guidance and the spiritual courage to be a part. Lord, we thank you for your loving kindness that is better than life. We thank you for this day. Let us go in peace. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you. God bless you. Take care.